Okay, welcome back. We're continuing chapter nine, event utility nodes and scripting. And so we have finished up with chapter overview and especially the concepts and now we're ready to go through the individual uh, X3D utility nodes that are part of this chapter. So we can see them here. Uh, we've got a handful of them and let's just start right in with uh, Boolean filter. Okay, so what do you use a Boolean filter for? Well, this is to pick whether or not you want uh, the true value or the false value from an event stream. Okay, and that might sound a little complicated or unusual, but it's actually quite common because uh, the sensors that we've looked at so far, particularly touch sensor, when you select something, if you use the is active event or is over event, you may recall that as you select a piece of geometry, a true is sent, a true event is sent, and when you deselect, a false event is sent. Okay, so uh, that means you'll get two events down that stream. So if you're, all you're doing is simply reacting to the presence of an event in the node that you receive the result to, it'll always be flipping back and forth and back and forth depending on is the mouse over, is it not over, is it active by selection, is it not active by deselection. Okay, so Boolean filter is just the right node to say give me only the trues or give me only the false events. All right, and so uh, you see that summarized here on this slide. And the definitions for this are, uh, it has a field called set boolean. That's the input field. That's where you would route some producer like a touch sensor to the boolean filter node. And then input true and input false, false those are the output fields. Those are the ones that you would route from in order to send it somewhere else, okay? And then input negate is also interesting. That's another output field, output only. And it would say uh, uh, whatever you got coming in, I'll give you the opposite. Okay, so if we hooked it up to our good old touch sensor, then instead of getting a true when you select, and a false when you deselect, you would get a, uh, uh, a false when you select and a true when you deselect, which might seem counterintuitive on the face of it, but is actually quite helpful when you start cooking up chains of nodes uh, for one thing, does the next thing, does the other, you know, building that Rube Goldberg machine. Sometimes that logic is uh, very helpful. Now let's see if we can't do a little knobology here and clean up this picture. I usually don't fuss with this, but let's try. We'll click on that guy and see if we can get the arrows to go. So there we go. Set Boolean in, input true out, input false out, input negate out. So same story. Uh, and then no initializable fields. So what does that mean? That means if you go to the editor for this node, there's not a whole lot there, okay? Because it's either input events or output events. So all you see on the editor for this node is can I def it? Can I use it? Another copy might be needed in a container field. Probably not. We almost never need a container field. So what we get instead is uh, different ways to route it. So let's trace the logic in this scene. The scene we're looking at is the Boolean filter for the pump house. And uh, so this is one of many scenes, many sub-scenes making up the kelp forest exhibit, uh, the aquarium, Monterey Bay Aquarium uh, uh, location that we built. And if we looked even way back, we go, oh wow, June 1998. Hey, that's, uh, that's 10 years ago. You got 3D that's 10 years old? 
we got lots. We're still improving it, refining it, but it works, and that's pretty cool. That's part of the value of X3D. Of course, back then, it was written in Vermal, virtual reality modeling language, and the original file was a .world file, and then we converted it to .x3d. So that's why this uh, file is still in there. You can also see when did we import it? When did we do that conversion? 2002. And of course today it's 2008 when we record this video and we're still going strong. Still getting uh, mileage out of some of these examples. Okay, so into the scene. What is our first route? Well, we see it there and we can see we started with a touch sensor and then we routed that up to the Boolean filter. So let's draw a little animation chain as we go here. We're going to go from the touch sensor to the Boolean filter and we can see the touch sensor is active. We want to make an explicit selection clicking with the uh, pointing device and then that goes to the filter. So set Boolean, oh yeah that was the easy choice because it's always the same, right? It's uh, set Boolean is the only input for that node. Okay, what's next? The uh, uh, oh, I guess I'm going to have to can my diagram here while we, uh, uh, let's see if I can make it go. Yeah, I had to can the diagram uh, while we animate the rest of this picture. Uh, so then once we got the uh, first event into the Boolean filter, then we want uh, a single event out, and that is the input true. Okay, so this is not saying did I get an input? Is that true or not? No, it's saying explicitly my input event was a true value. I am filtering the falses away and I am allowing the true value to pass. So that true value gets passed through and where do we send it to? To the enabled field of a timer. At least the note's called timer. It's actually a time sensor. And then what happens? Well then we have our typical orientation, uh, excuse me, our typical animation chain where the time sensor clock is driving an interpolator, in this case an orientation interpolator, and then we set a transform. Okay, so let's redraw the uh, 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 animation chain diagram now. We started with our time sensor, excuse me, our touch sensor, and we routed that is active, which could either be a true or a false. We routed that to our Boolean filter, and that's only going to pass a true event, and that's going to go up to our time sensor. So instead of abbreviating it TS, I'll draw a little clock face on there. And then finally, uh, well, almost finally, we then go to an orientation interpolator. And finally, finally, we go to our transform node, our target. And so, okay, just by this logic here, it says, well, we're rotating, except when we stop it. And uh, so let's check out the functionality here. So we'll go over to X3D Edit and Boolean filter pump house. So as I move my mouse over the pump house uh, for this example, you can see my icon changes from a navigation arrow to a little hand with a finger pointing saying, uh, click me, <laughs> select me. So if I now press down and select, and I'm still selecting, you can see that uh, the animation has started and we're just whizzing around those uh, three cones, red, green, blue cones. If I let go of the mouse and deselect, it keeps going, and it keeps going, and it keeps going, and I kind of thought it was going to stop here, but I guess not. So uh, let's recheck our logic on that guy.
full screen on this. And ah, uh, yes, there's the uh, there's the field that controlled that. Okay, we started with enabled false, which means it's not running, but once it is enabled, loop is true. Okay, so if all we're passing is true events, then once it started, it started, and we have no way to turn it off. You could sort of think of it as, all right, we've changed our on-off light switch to simply an on light switch, and once you turn it on, you're all done, because that's all, it, all that's there. Now that's what the uh, screen snapshot says. Let's check the uh, uh, actual example and make sure that's what our source says. Here's our source. Here's our time sensor. Uh, we'll open up the editor on this guy. And we see Sure enough, enabled was default as off as our initial setting, but loop was defined as true right there. Okay. Uh, there you go. Let's also open up the editor for that good old Boolean filter. And sure enough, there's not a lot there. There are no fields to set, so there's nothing in the interface really other than could you give it a def name, and sure enough, there's the def name filter right in there. Okay, so uh, there's our example. Then we can get our tooltips. It's a little reminder, uh, if you want the tooltips, you can either uh, launch them yourself or you can get them through the help system. So let's uh, test that feature. I'll reopen my uh, editor here, click on help, and uh, our tooltips come up in the X3D edit help, and sure enough, there's Boolean filter right there. And, uh, whoops, I shouldn't have resized it, but let's just click help again. tips and boolean filter and boom presto however you get there several ways to do it uh, we've got it and we can see set boolean it's the input value input true only passes a true value input false only passes a false value Input negate was a nice little extra feature we tossed in there where it's filtering and flipping it as it goes. Okay. Let's look at our next node. Boolean sequencer. All right. Uh, we went through how sequencers are very similar to interpolators. You have a key array of what are the fraction indexes, and you have a key value array of what are the values that correspond to each time index. So we want to have uh, pairwise, uh, same number of key and key value. They need to have the same count, the same size. And then once we have those, our set fraction is what gets us in there to see it. You might recall the diagram we did on uh, uh, right in the last lesson. Uh, here it was for the first example where you get a corresponding true and false value as you put them in the arrays here corresponding to each time fraction. So once again we have the same number of each. There, it's a pairwise definition and you absolutely can think of this as an impulse function that pops out a value each time your set fraction time clock value proceeds. So as this goes forward and gets bigger and bigger and different larger values, 
then as it hits 0.2, then we send out that. As it gets bigger, once it gets equal to or greater than 0.4, then we'll send out a true, etc. Right through. Okay, get back to our slide. So what else? Oh, and here's a nice consistency. The output value of this sequencer, once again, is named value changed. Makes it easy to remember. We could have come up with slightly different names for all of the default outputs on the sequencers, but what's the point of that? It's always going to be a value. The value will be typed based on the node. So this makes it easier to remember and easier for tools to support what field are you connecting. And then we have some uh, extra things that you can't really do in an interpolator, but are nice here. We're taking advantage of the discrete single value outputs of this sequencer by having next and previous. So uh, it might be that you want to go forward across the time clock, but not drive it with time. Actually just drive it with a logical, give me the next one, give me the next one, give me the next one. So we could hook this up to uh, even our previous example is uh, if you wanted to step through a set of logic like uh, is the door open, is it shut, is it open, is it shut, you might use that uh, uh, touch sensor to route that value and then have the Boolean sequencer go to the next. So next and previous. Just go to whatever the last one is, plus one, and does it there. And because uh, uh, they either are or they aren't, we get an SF bool value, a Boolean, and uh, that makes it pretty easy. Let me make sure I uh, remember something. I believe the way this works is you don't have to filter this. so. If, for example, your touch sensor is sending you first a true and then a false, and the true says go to next, well, okay, it goes to the next one. If you deselect and you're sending a false to next, then the logic could say, well, yeah, I tickled the next field, but it was with a false event, so that doesn't make sense. It's false, so I shouldn't go to next. So let's check and see if this works the way I'm thinking. Uh, we'll examine the diagram first before we go into the X3D editor. And we have, uh, very similar to our interpolator type of layout here on the editor, where you can put in each of the key values. But what we've taken advantage of is, uh, instead of making you type in true or false, we just take advantage of good GUI design and just use a checkbox. So you don't have to worry about spelling true or spelling false correctly. Uh, it just does that for you. And then uh, what happens next? Well, let's see. Here's our first route, our uh, touch sensor, which isn't shown on this screen. It's just down farther in this uh, fairly large scene. When the touch sensor goes active, it's routed up to the time sensor. Okay, and uh, if you want to confirm that, well, our time sensor is called interrupt timer. So sure enough, there's the route right there. We're routing to interrupt timers enable field, and it's coming from interrupt pump, the is active field. So there's our touch sensor right there. And enabled is our destination right there. So once again, just like the last scene, this example is turning on a time sensor to begin its activity. We can see that once again this had a loop true uh, to cycle it. Keep it going. Let's look at the next event. Okay, very sim simple animation chain, this time with a Boolean sequencer. Our timer is driving the Boolean sequencer, and we can see that we have 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine values defined in the key. So we can't check here, but I would expect when we go into the editor or if you examine the file directly, you'd find it. Yes, indeed, you better have nine Boolean values right there. Okay, what's the next route? The next route will go from the Boolean sequencer up to uh, another time sensor. We go, oh, that's interesting. We haven't seen that kind of animation chain before, where we go time sensor to something else and then another time sensor. But really what we're doing is we're tickling the clock that actually finally does the piston operation. So there's our piston interpolator, the thing that moves it up and down, and then that route goes to the piston transform. Okay, so what we're doing is turning on and off the animation behavior. All right, let's draw the animation chain for that then. So first we had a uh, touch sensor, and then we had that turning on and off a clock, a time sensor, and then that went to a Boolean sequencer, whether or not we're on or off. And that output is true or false is then going to another clock, another time sensor, which in turn drives our position interpolator and finally our target transform node that makes the piston go up and down. Okay, so let's check that, see how it looks. Back into X3D Edit and the scene we want is a uh, Boolean What are we doing here? Let's get the right scene. Boolean sequencer pump house. There we go. Boolean sequencer pump house. Okay, we can see the pump house going up and down, sort of intermittently going. Let's do the touch sensor. And if I select, well, that wasn't too evident, was it? There we go. It's uh, stopped. And then I select it again, and it keeps going. And you can see how uh, when it is going, it's kind of jerky. And the jerky is because the uh, intermediate Boolean sequencer is either turning the secondary time sensor on or off. Right? So when I uh, deselect the mouse, then the first time sensor is disabled and nothing happens. When I select with the mouse, then the first time sensor is turned on. Uh, the second time sensor is then tickled on and off. So what we see is sort of an erratic, intermittent behavior. And that's why it's either going or uh, going intermittently or not at all. So fairly sophisticated. Let's uh, open this up and look at the node. Okay, there's our same, <coughs> same scene that we were working with. Uh, let's pull up our Boolean sequencer editor. Open her up a little bit, and sure enough, there are our values, and there are our corresponding clicks. Now, you may have noticed this in some of the other scenes. And that is, uh, we usually always go 0 to 1 so that it's explicitly defined at the beginning and the end of the range. This is particularly important when looping. And you'll also notice that uh, whenever we do that, try to have the same value at the beginning and the end. And the reason for that is you don't want a sudden jump each time the loop cycles. You don't want it toggling to opposite values, but you want to have a recurring pattern. Okay, so if we didn't find that it was repeating the cycle on an even 
true, false, true, false, true, false, you would just have to subtract one or add one of the pairs here so that you end up on the right step. Okay. If instead of a erratic pump behavior, this was a, a walking left, right, left, right, left, right, you wouldn't want it to get to the end of a, a six step pace and suddenly flip or maybe a five step pace. You'd want it to have the proper order, the proper number of these things. Okay, so there's a little subtlety in that scene that you might want to consider when you define your own. What else is in here? Uh, of course, the def name is uh, about the only other thing. Okay, so uh, another scene. Um, that's our Boolean sequencer. As usual, we have uh, tool tips for this guy. Okay, next note, Boolean toggle. Toggling, as it turns out, is, was a very tricky business before we added the event utilities, because you had to write a script node for that. That's with most of these things, but you had to get the logic just right. It was very error prone. Uh, so it's a very simple concept. The toggle remembers. It remembers what did it have last time and then lets you flip-flop state, okay, uh, hence the name. So we do have a variable that we can modify, and that's the state variable, the state that gets remembered, which is called toggle. And then we negate that if it gets the set boolean, in other words, our typical input is named true. But if we get a set boolean that's false, meaning don't set the boolean, don't perform the action of this node, it leaves it alone. Okay, so that's very helpful as we described before if you're hooking up is active, is over, because that means we don't need what? What do you say guys? What don't we need then if it ignores the false? That's right, boolean filter. Okay, because the Boolean filter only passes true or passes false. If we didn't ignore the falses, then we would still need a Boolean filter. So we have designed these utilities not only to hook together, but also to be pretty efficient about it. So you don't have to use all of them all the time. If you hook them up in the way normal practice is, it just works fine. Okay. Uh, another important piece on the toggle before, uh, this is one of these things where you wonder if you should mention it, uh, but the failure mode was so egregious, so horrible that I, I am going to mention it in case you see it, then you'll know what to do. If, if you find that, well, things only change when I select with my pointer and I want to say turn a light on and leave it on and go somewhere else. Well. If we do that with just an is active and not a boolean toggle in the middle, then you select it, okay, the light goes on, I can see, and then what's next? Well, we want to navigate over there or see something or do something, but oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. As soon as I let go, as soon as I deselect my touch sensor, it turns the light back off again and you can't see. Uh, what good is this? So if you're stuck with the user not able to let go of the pointer, to, to make things going, then that's, that's telling you, oh, you need to remember. You need to remember a setting without being constantly held. So use the Boolean toggle node to remember state. Okay, so let's look at the example here. Uh, actually, no, let's elaborate it just a little bit more. So here's a typical setup for that, and when you might use it, we've got a uh, uh, typical event chain of a, uh, uh, a touch sensor and a Boolean toggle and then a, a time sensor. Or you could uh, 
uh, if you didn't want it to trigger on the select but on the deselect then you could do uh, this second chain, the touch sensor, uh, again the boolean filter uh, that in this case only passes the input false okay which is the deselect or the not is over anymore and then toggle and then the time sensor clock okay so uh, you might find that further helpful uh, let's see if I remember this correctly I believe that you can avoid the the deselect if you drag off the object before you let go so uh, this can be a helpful way to allow the user to change their mind, okay? Because once you select, you're committed, it goes. But if you, once you get sensitized to this issue, you can see it in other tools, other software tools that you might use, not just X3D. But sometimes when you select something, you're holding it there. Do I want this? Do I want this? And if you don't want it, you move the mouse off and then let go, and nothing happens. <coughs> so this... <coughs> Excuse me, this little refinement at the end can be very helpful, this alternate here. It's to swap on deselection instead of on selection. Okay, now let's look at the scene. Uh, this uh, Boolean toggle is kind of a curious scene when we go live, uh, see whether it's jittery or not. This cone is bouncing around so fast that uh, it looks very jittery. So that's an interesting animation technique and then when we select on the uh, button that will stop it from moving and uh, it'll just look steady again. Okay, so let's take a look at the logic here. And we start out with our uh, typical touch sensor and uh, we send it to our toggler and then the, the boolean toggle goes to a filter and this is called T as in uh, a branching T. The T is going to go in two directions meaning uh, the boolean filter is going to get sent both ways so the next place it goes is to a pause on and then time after that it goes to a pause off two different time trigger nodes. Now what's a time trigger? Well we'll see it later on in the uh, uh, chapter, but basically it, it takes a Boolean input and gives you a time output. Okay, so depending on whether it was true or false, this is what's going on here. Next route is those true or falses go down to the uh, time sensor. You can see it has a very short cycle interval 0.15 seconds or uh, uh, about six and a half cycles per second uh, when we do that and then uh, that time sensor drives a position interpolator that shakes things around and that finally gets routed way back up to our transform that does it. Okay, fairly complicated logic. Let's run it. Okay, so our scene is Boolean toggle Okay, Boolean toggle and uh, my oh my, isn't that shaky? Maybe too shaky. But if we click on it, I'm selecting now, it stops. When I deselect, nothing happens. When I select again, it's still it's shaking. When I deselect, it continues shaking. Oh, okay, so this little red cylinder here that's facing us. Let's rotate it around. See, okay, that's really a red push button that remembers. It's an on-off switch. Click to start, click to stop. Click to start, click to stop. And in between each one I can move my mouse around, I can move the pointer elsewhere so I don't have to hold the pointer on endlessly to get an action. Okay.
So very common animation activity. Uh, probably what we should do here is try the uh, uh, deselect and let's see if we can do this. Well, let's take a look at the uh, the nodes first. Here's our Boolean filter. Sure enough, no fields there to mess with. Here's our Boolean toggle. Uh, uh oh. Oh, we got a bug. Right, we should have a field there, correct? Let's check it out. Yeah, the toggle value. Okay, how did we miss that? I don't know. Let's pause. Let's take a pause in the action and say, well, what do we do when we find a bug in X3D Edit? We've, we've gone through this before, but maybe not for a long time. So we'll file a bug. You guys want to see how to file a bug here? Um, she gets up there somewhere. Let's follow the File the uh, follow the bug here. I'll log in and uh, create a new bug. And this goes under X3D. Then it goes under uh, X3D Edit 3.2. And then we'll say Boolean toggle editor missing the toggle. Okay, and then the detailed description is uh, missing the toggle field. Uh, please add it as a checkbox. Okay, so that's now in our uh, bug database, and Mike Bailey and I will take a look at that and figure out how to stick that in. Not so bad, and hopefully by the time you see this video, it'll be all fixed already. Okay, uh, yeah, why don't we leave it at that? Let's keep going through the rest nodes. Okay, here's our help for Boolean toggle. Now we're ready for Boolean trigger. Okay, what does it do? It takes an input SF time. And let's use the arrow guy. and it converts it into an output SF bool. So uh, how does it do that? Well actually this is not so well labeled, is it? What our field names are. So how do we get our field names? Uh, well I expect it'll be set boolean and um, uh, trigger output. So let's take a look at the node itself. We'll go into X3D Edit and find our example, Boolean Trigger. And this is Boolean Trigger Pump House. And here's the node itself, Boolean Trigger. Okay, as with most of these uh, Guys, there's not a lot there except for a def name. Uh, so let's look at the route that connects that Boolean trigger. Okay, here's the route, and if we edit the route, now we get to see, sure enough, trigger start is the def name, but Boolean trigger is the node type. So now if we go into the node and inspect uh, what fields can be edited on it, we see that, well, set trigger time is our input, and uh, if we find our other route that has it, right here, trigger start, we see its uh, output is trigger true. 
So that's the case with uh, most of the trigger nodes. Okay, so a note to self in the uh, slides here, I'll list the uh, uh, trigger true and the uh, set event for it, set trigger time. And I believe we'll, we'll see that the uh, exact same fields hold true for our other trigger node. We try to keep consistent naming. So if you're worried about, well, how, do I, how on earth do I remember all these field names? The moral of the story there is uh, don't remember them all. Instead, use the interface in X3D Edit to tell you what they are because uh, it will prompt you with the right ones and also prompt against the wrong ones if you have the wrong data type there. The other way to check it out is we go to the, uh, the proper tooltip for it. So for Boolean trigger, here we go. We have them listed set trigger true and trigger true as the uh, output. our input and whether or not the trigger was true is our output. Okay, the other thing to see for this is that like most, now well, let's, let's clear all that other stuff here and say like most other trigger nodes it takes a time input and gives you a typed output. How do you know which one? Well, the name of it is Boolean Trigger. So it gets triggered by a timestamp, by an SF time event, and it outputs a Boolean because that's the name of the trigger node, Boolean Trigger. Okay, so common design patterns. All right then, Let's see if we're set. Here's our logic on this uh, particular guy. How does it work? Well, we uh, have our touch sensor, or we could have touched it with, well, yeah, touch sensor, but this time we give it a time input because we're always triggering off of time. And then uh, we output a Boolean to the time sensor, which then turns it on or off. And we can see that the uh, default here uh, was enabled, where are we, uh, time sensor enabled, false. And of course once we have the time sensor then we get our typical animation chain for position interpolator up to a transform. So let's re-examine the scene then. trigger pump house and I open this up a little bit now I'm gonna I put my mouse over the pump house select it and uh, uh, let go and we see that the animation has started okay now could you have done it a different way yes we we had other examples before that used uh, different boolean triggers on there excuse me different boolean enablers but this time we didn't Q on the Boolean of is active or is over, but rather the touch time, an SF time event. <coughs> okay, each of these bears a little repeating and looking at uh, each node and comparing the types and seeing how they work. Jeff, let's pause the, uh, let's not stop, but Let's give an edit here because my throat's about to <coughs> explode. So I'll take some more drugs. But here, guys, uh, there's a lot of cough drop. Have you ever seen these? Fisherman's Friend. I always feel like I'm on a on a on a you know a fishing boat on the North Atlantic when I take one of these because it, it tastes about the same as a uh, uh, big wave hitting you in the face salt water, you know, 
besides getting inside your rain gear, your swallow, you, you know all about that stuff, right? Right, Laurie, yeah. And you're not putting that on camera, right, Jeff? Uh, we're okay. editing this part out, yeah. The blooper reel. Because, you know, this starts... Yeah, the conversation goes south for here. We start talking about how much seawater we squeezed out of our socks and stuff like that, so... Okay, I think we're down to two nodes left. And we've run a little long, but I think it'd be better to finish those two nodes. And then this block is done, and we'll get into script node on the next round. I can't believe I left those fields off. Slide, I just rechecked those twice. But there you go. Everything good so far? Ready to go to the next? Okay, so uh, almost there, just a couple more uh, event utilities. Our next one, integer sequencer. This was in our, our first example where we were toggling lights on and off and we were toggling the integer uh, or cycling through integers to get a different child text. So what do we see here? We see a lot of the same good stuff. It's like a, an interpolator in that it has key and key value, but there, it's an impulse function this time sending out a single integer value as each one trips. Just like the uh, interpolators, we call it value changed. Just like our other sequencer, we've got next and previous, so we can toggle our way through it. We don't have to run it through a, with a clock, we can just run it with a touch sensor, and that's pretty cool. And, and that simplifies our, uh, our use of uh, animation chains because then we can just use a direct connection for next and previous rather than hooking up a whole elaborate clock sequence for it. So let's look at our example. This one's called, uh, not the previous example we examined, but a different one, integer sequencer for the pump house. And here's our interf interface. You can see our key key value arrays have one, two, three, four entries this time and it's cycling uh, what values? Zero, one, two, negative one. Okay, so we go, all right, that's probably tickling a switch node again, switching through children. Let's see if that's the case. Um, here we go, next route. We go from a touch sensor to the integer sequencer, and sure enough, the value changed at the integer sequencer goes to the which choice field of the uh, switch. As ever, we start counting from zero, not from one, so that means the initial child, not the first child, the initial child is the zeroth child. Negative one means none of the above. So we go zero, one, two. We use the uh, interface in X3D Edit to iconize those three nodes. You can click on a minus sign, turn it to a plus to uh, iconize it and compress your scene graph to make it a little more evident of what's going on. And what else do we have in here? We have a time sensor that is uh, driving an orientation interpolator to move things around. Okay, so let's examine the scene itself. And this is Boolean, no it's not. This is uh, integer sequencer pump house that we're looking for. <coughs> All right, integer sequencer pump house. Okay says click pump house for our next cone. Let's uh, zoom out a little bit so we can see what's going on here. Okay, we have a cone sweeping around in a circle. I'll navigate it just a little bit. And then uh, 
We'll put the mouse over the pump house and I'll select and deselect. And gee whiz, nothing's happened when I do run. Pump house touched. It gets routed for. Well, I don't know. I thought I tested this one. Let's launch it in another browser and heck, we'll launch it in all and see what happens. Okay, Swirl doesn't have any of these yet. Looks like uh, Bit Management has none of them. Here we go, Octaga. When I select, I change color on it. When I deselect, it changed again. Select, deselect. So let's toggle through uh, the whole thing. And once again, I'll say out loud when I'm selecting with the mouse. Select, deselect, select, deselect, select, deselect, select, deselect. Okay, so we can see, I think, that when it's rotating, there were the three cones that we had before, and instead of having them grouped and all three rotating, we changed the group out to be a switch in that example, so that only one of the cones was visible at a time. And now selecting, deselecting, each time is toggling our, uh, our integer sequencer. And let's check out Instant Reality, see how they do. Okay, when I go select, switches, deselect, nothing. Select, switches to the negative one, deselect, nothing. Select, switches, deselect. Okay, so I think what we've just seen is that uh, Instant Reality gets it just right. It's, the, it's only honoring the next field if it gets a true value from select. When it gets a false value from deselect, it ignores it. Octaga gets an honorable mention because it's doing mostly the right thing, but it's not uh, sending, uh, but, it, but it's queuing on false events when it should. Uh, unfortunately, uh, XJ3D not working at all on this one contact not working at all maybe for that no maybe for another one not sure okay so let's put that in the notes we won't put it in the slide notes but we'll issue uh, bug reports uh, xj3d uh, fails octaga is ignoring uh, should ignore the false field And the guys who don't do it at all, we're not going to pick on or poke at because uh, they pretty much know what they haven't done yet. Everybody has their work list. Okay, let's see what's next. Tool tips for integer sequencer. We'll go into all the details. Now we've got integer trigger. Okay, what does integer trigger do? Well, as we might expect, uh, uh, it triggers off an input value and this time it's triggering off a uh, boolean input and then it gives you a uh, output value and that output uh, is a not an array or a series of the this is not the same as integer sequencer where you give it a whole array but rather since it's a trigger it has a very simple functionality. You pull the trigger, boom, it's gone. So this is why it's an SF int. SF standing for single field, which equals single value. And that's all it does. Okay, so the trigger value output, uh, uh, you, you pick a number, that's it for this node. So if you want different triggers to do different things, you would have to have a different number for each one. And so that's where that's described. 
What is the value? It's the field integer key. So typically you might do this for a button to say, select the third child of my switch, or select the seventh child of my switch, or send a single integer somewhere in the scene graph where I want it. Let's look at the example. Uh, pretty interesting example. The, uh, uh, the three different screen snapshots here are just uh, superimposed and we would run one or another. Let me show you first by we'll go to the live example and then we'll, uh, then we'll animate the routes. Okay, so integer trigger, select text to change color. If I put my mouse over and select, deselect, select, deselect, select, deselect. I think you see what I'm talking about where the, uh, uh, we don't have three sets of text jumping around. We just have, to the user's perspective, the color changing on that text. So let's, uh, let's examine that a little further in the scene here. Uh, where does that text appear? Select text to change, color, and then uh, notice how we set that text message once and then def that text and reuse it down here with a different material in a different group. And so if we iconize each of these things, we can see sure enough there's our switch with three group nodes. And those three group nodes are reusing that same text geometry right there, but we give it different material colors. So in this manner, if we decided to change uh, the wording of this to say select the words, to change color. And we'll drag this bad boy down here. If it'll let me know it's it's not, so we'll just re reload it right there. Didn't like that. Let's launch it. We got an update from the uh, XJ3D guys, they've, they've delayed their uh, release of 2.0 because they're doing more testing, so that's good. So that's a bug in our, our hookup to XJ3D, but you can see that even though the built-in XJ3D didn't update, the external one did, and my retype of the words changed it. So I only had to change that text in one place, and we still have different functionality for different, different uh, materials. Okay, so there's the hand-waving part. Let's, uh, let's tease this thing apart. So we're only getting one message at a time and we want to toggle which of the children of the switch node is changing. So first we have our touch sensor and uh, notice that's a peer of the text node itself because touch sensor works on peered geometry. So that's why we put the touch sensor right there. And that's our first thing then. So we touch the text, it goes to integer filter. If we touch the next text in the next guy, it uh, goes to the next. If we touch the third, third piece of text with a third integer trigger, third touch sensor, uh, it goes right there. You can see that we didn't have a single touch sensor. We didn't defuse that, but rather we had three different touch sensors corresponding to the three pieces of geometry. So one, two, three, we get a corresponding result. And then each of those is routed to the exact same destination. So the first one, if that gets triggered, it's gonna say, give me the first filter. And that gets routed to the switch node, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, 
I think we've got the logic of that one. Let's look back one more time in the scene to see if there's anything else to get on this guy. Uh, maybe just open up the node. There's our integer trigger node. And sure enough, we do have the value exposed here as expected. There's our integer key that is the value that gets used. Okay, are we done? I think we're down to the last node. Yep, last node for today, time trigger. So what does a time trigger do? It takes a Boolean input and it gives a uh, trigger time output. Okay, so once again, this is, you could sort of think of this as the opposite of Boolean trigger, which got a, a time input Boolean output. Instead, time trigger is the exact opposite. It gets a Boolean input and gives you a time output. So when do you need that? Well, one way to answer which node do you need, <coughs> you let the 10-step program decide that for you. You say, what's my target? When I set up a route, who am I going to? So it's often, usually driven by what is the target in mind. <coughs> Excuse me. So here are our typical targets here, time sensor, movie texture, or audio clip. Let's look at the uh, uh, example here. We've got a time trigger node in the middle here with a Boolean filter and a touch sensor. So we start by having the touch sensor, if it's active, if it's selected, it goes to the Boolean filter. And then we're going to route from the Boolean filter which one? We're only going to route the true values only. Input true gets routed to the time trigger. So we're not going on each one. We don't. In fact, the whole point of it is we don't want each one. We're going to let Boolean filter just give us the true values. Then what? Uh, the time trigger routes to our script node. Our script node here is going to say, if I get a timestamp, I'm going to print it out. Okay, so I've got two arrows here, but it's really just one big happy event going in. And when we do script nodes, we'll see what that is. But I think just by inspecting it here, uh, everybody's probably plenty smart enough to say, well, if I tell it to print a timestamp, then it goes to the browser and it prints, hey, I got a trigger time value. Hello world, here we are. Okay, so. Uh, and there's our end result. We also print out if we get an is active uh, directly, unfiltered. Okay, so what's our output here? If you open up the console where you get debugging messages from your browser, you say, oh, we printed it out ourselves. We didn't wait for uh, the browser to print, so we, we just told it what to print. So this is a nice debugging technique. So the first time we clicked we got three outputs like that. The second time we clicked, we got three outputs like that, where it's simply reporting, I got this, I got that, I got the next thing. So this time trigger test not only exercises the node, but it lets us uh, show a little bit, sneak preview of the script node, and a nice debugging technique. So let's find this last example of the event utilities. Oh, and the pressure's on now, huh? low battery. So time trigger test. We'll look at the time trigger node. Open her up. No fields, right? It's just Boolean in, time out. Okay, if we launch this guy, and I'll launch it, uh, it was just tested in instant reality. They had good support for the node and for the scripting. Some of the others may work too, but I know this one should work. So we'll bring up the uh, console window and we will, uh, I better not dim it for my battery, it won't be on the recording. Uh, we see a bunch of browser stuff warning us, okay, it started up. Now when I click here, click, click, if we look at the console, you'll see that it updates each time I select. So there are the selections so far. I'll select again, select, 
and sure enough we got another entry with the the time trigger time the trigger time is active true and is active false okay so this also illustrates that when we use the time trigger we got <coughs> a single output whereas if we just route directly we get a dual output of first true and then false so you can think of this as yet another way to filter yet another way to put things together as you wire up your animation chains what's right for you all depends start with the end in mind use your 10 step process to say what am I trying to animate where don't have to memorize each and every node just say I've got a rich set of functionality here and I can work backwards to get the exact logic that I want to do okay so let's review where are we we have finished the uh, uh, those nodes if we go to uh, our overview then we're ready in the next session, having done all of these guys, we're ready to look at script where we get to control every aspect of input and output and then write the parts for what's in between. Thanks a lot. See you next time.